Hello, this is Dean Hess. I am the managing editor of Respiratory Care. With the current shortage of ventilators that is occurring in some ICUs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the intent of this presentation is to discuss how we might use a ventilator that is designed for non-invasive ventilation to provide invasive ventilation. These are my disclosures. However, my presentation will be very generic and I will not be discussing any specific manufacturers by name. Let's begin by discussing for a minute CPAP versus bi-level ventilation. CPAP devices that are intended for use in patients with obstructive sleep apnea cannot be repurposed for invasive ventilation. With these devices, there's no ventilation support, and it is difficult to provide a high FiO2. Bi-level devices, however, can be used for ventilation. I would point out that BiPAP is a brand name, and I will not be using that in this presentation, but rather using the term bi-level. These devices provide positive pressure ventilation. They are ventilators, whether they are used invasively or non-invasively. Some of them are FDA cleared for invasive ventilation, so you can set the device for invasive ventilation or for non-invasive ventilation, whichever is appropriate at the time. Devices used for home ventilation, either nocturnal ventilation or continuous ventilation, can also be repurposed to provide invasive ventilation. This cartoon illustrates the component parts of a bi-level device. There is a blower and pressure controller, a single limb circuit. There is a leak port, which for non-invasive ventilation can either be in the circuit near the mask or be in the mask itself. What we can do for invasive ventilation is rather than attaching the circuit to the mask, we can attach the circuit directly to the patient. It is important that a leak port is present in the circuit because that is the expiratory port for the patient. If the system that you typically use for non-invasive ventilation incorporates the leak port into the mask, then you will need to change to a circuit that incorporates a leak port. Also, it is important that the leak port is filtered to prevent aerosolization into the room and potential contamination of care providers. Filters are available from manufacturers. I suggest that you contact the manufacturer of the device that you use for an appropriate filter to be placed over the leak port. Because we are going to use the device invasively attached to an endotracheal tube, it is important that the inspired gas is humidified. We can either do that with an active humidifier, such as we would use on an ICU ventilator, or we can use a heat and moisture exchanger. I would suggest that we might consider using a heat and moisture exchanging filter device or an HMEF. The filter will provide some additional safety as related to aerosols exhaled from the patient entering into the environment. What are the settings that we should consider if we are to use a bi-level device for invasive ventilation? In some ways, the settings are similar to non-invasive ventilation, but we will be using settings that are more consistent with an ARDS strategy. Generally, we will set an IPAP or an inspiratory positive airway pressure. This will be the peak inspiratory pressure, which during pressure control ventilation approximates the plateau pressure. And we set an EPAP or expiratory positive airway pressure, which is the level of PEEP that the patient receives. 
The difference between the IPAP and the EPAP is the driving pressure, and that will determine the tidal volume that is delivered. As far as mode, I would recommend using the spontaneous timed or ST mode. If your device has a pressure control mode, you could use that as well. I would suggest to avoid volume targeted modes and modes for sleep disordered breathing, which are available in some of these devices. Keep it simple, and I think that in most cases that will mean using a spontaneous time mode. Also, avoid modes that do not have a backup rate. So do not use a mode which is a spontaneous breathing mode that does not provide a backup rate. We will need to set the rate on the device, the inspiratory time, and the FiO2. As far as starting settings, I would suggest an IPAP of 25 and an EPAP of 12. That will result in a driving pressure of 13 centimeters of water. Generally, we want to keep the driving pressure less than 15 centimeters of water to minimize ventilator-induced lung injury. We want to adjust the IPAP for tidal volume, targeting 6 mLs per kilogram of predicted body weight. A reasonable starting tidal volume is 400 milliliters. One must also remember to adjust the IPAP whenever the EPAP is changed. In other words, if the EPAP is increased, the IPAP must be increased by the same amount to maintain the driving pressure, or if the EPAP is decreased, the IPAP must be decreased by the same amount in order to maintain the driving pressure. As far as mode, again, I would recommend the spontaneous time mode, although pressure control mode is also okay if your device has that mode. I would suggest a starting respiratory rate of 25 breaths per minute, an inspiratory time of 0.8 seconds, and an FiO2 of 1. I think it is important to note that these settings are higher than typically used with these devices for non-invasive ventilation. In this setting, we are using the device for acute respiratory failure, many of these patients will also have ARDS, so we are setting the ventilator to mimic how we would ventilate a patient with ARDS using an ICU ventilator. Here again is our cartoon of the bi-level device. In some of these devices, there is a blender if there's a blender, we can set the FiO2 directly as we would on an ICU ventilator. However, some of these devices do not have an internal blender, so we will need to titrate oxygen into the circuit from a flow meter. If we use the titration approach, it is difficult to deliver a high FiO2. The FiO2 will also vary with minute ventilation. If minute ventilation goes up for the same oxygen flow, the FiO2 will go down and vice versa. With either a blender or titrating oxygen into the circuit with a flow meter, we will want to target the flow or the FiO2 to the oxygen saturation in the patient measured by pulse oximetry. As far as monitoring, we want to monitor tidal volume. Many bi-level devices will display the tidal volume. We again want to target a tidal volume of 6 mLs per kilogram of predicted body weight, which will be about 400 milliliters in many patients. We want to target an oxygen saturation of 88 to 95 percent. The use of capnography is somewhat controversial, I would say this is not absolutely necessary, and in fact, you might not have a capnograph available that you can use. There are some issues with the leak in the circuit and the disease state of the patient, which makes the end tidal PCO2 perhaps not a very good surrogate for the arterial PCO2. However, if you do have a capnograph available, that might be useful to serve as a disconnect alarm. 
Just as we would if using an ICU ventilator, we will want to periodically evaluate the patient's arterial blood gases and make changes in the settings as might be directed by the blood gas results. It is important that we set alarms just as it would be when using an ICU ventilator. The most important alarm is a disconnect alarm. So we want to set an alarm so that if the circuit becomes disconnected from the endotracheal tube that there will be a prompt alarm for that. For many of these devices, we can set a disconnect alarm in the device. Again, if we have capnometry available, that can be used to serve as a disconnect alarm. If possible, we will want to set alarms for tidal volume and minute ventilation. We will want to set alarms on the pulse oximeter, particularly for a low oxygen saturation and some of the bi-level devices have available additional alarms that we should also set appropriately with patient safety in mind. If possible, we will want to triage the available ventilators. As ventilators become in short supply, it may become increasingly difficult to triage as well as we might like. I would suggest that we try to reserve our ICU ventilators for our sickest patients, and then we might use NIV ventilators that are FDA cleared for invasive ventilation. And then finally, we might consider using bi-level ventilators that are designed primarily for home care in our least sick patients. In summary, CPAP devices do not provide ventilation. Thus, it is not possible to use a CPAP designed for obstructive sleep apnea as an invasive ventilator. Bi-level devices are ventilators. They can be used for invasive ventilation. And the same principles apply to bi-level ventilators for invasive ventilation as for ICU ventilators.